we understand that india has a federal structure of governance however an important feature here to be noted is that the constitution of india has not described india as a federation on the other hand article 1 of the constitution describes india as a union of states this means india is a union comprising of various states which are integral part of it the indian union is not destructible here the states cannot break away from the union they do not have the right to secede from the union indian system combines the features of a federal government and the features of a unitary government which can also be called the non federal features because of this india is regarded as a semi federal state that is a federal structure with a strong bias towards the center in a federal system there is a clear cut division of powers and responsibilities that is the duties between the center that is the union and the states in our constitution administrative legislative judicial and financial powers of the center and states have been clearly demarcated the division of the distribution has been provided for by the constitution of india in its seventh schedule for the smooth fun- running of the government according to the administrative divisions india has 29 states and seven union territories there is a union government in the center and a state government in each state each of these states has an elected government headed by a chief minister a governor is appointed by the indian president as the representative head of the federal authority in each state the form of government in india is thus quasi federal form with federal structure and strong unitary spirit in the federal form of government the power is divided between a union and states and constitutional political units the two levels of government are interdependent and share sovereignty the federal system also provides that the constitution is the supreme power of the land after studying this module you shall be able to know about the division of power and functions between the union government and the state governments and also about the mechanism in which these powers are divided learn about constitutional provisions through which the financial powers are distributed identify the three lists through which powers are divided between the union and the states and the different types of taxes imposed by the union and the states we understand that india has a federal structure of governance however an important thing here to be noted is that the constitution of india has not described india as a federation on the other hand article 1 of the constitution describes her as a union of states this means india is a union comprising of various states which are integral parts of it the indian union is non destructible here the states cannot break away from the union they do not have the right to secede from the union indian system combines the features of a federal government and the features of a unitary government which can also be called the non federal features because of this india is regarded as a semi federal state that is a federal structure with a strong bias towards the center in a federal system there is a clear cut division of powers and responsibilities between the center and the states different types of power are administrative financial judicial and legislative powers this division or distribution has been provided for by the constitution of india in its seventh schedule for the smooth running of the government according to the administrative divisions india has 28 states and seven union territories there is a union government in the center and a state government in each state Each of these states has an elected government headed by a chief minister. A governor is appointed by the Indian president as the representative head of the federal authority in each state. The form of government in India is quasi federal form. 
with federal structure and strong unitary spirit. In the federal form of government, the power is divided between a union and states as a constitutional political units. These two levels of government are interdependent and share sovereignty. The federal system also provides that the constitution is the supreme power of the land. Based on the distribution of power between the central government and the state government, there are three lists, union list, state list, and concurrent list. Thus, based on the distribution of power between the central government and the state governments, there are three lists. These are the union list, the state list, and the current list. The union list consists of subjects on which the central government of the India parliament can make laws. These subjects included in the list are of national importance. The central government has the power of making laws on these subjects at all times and also during emergencies. There are 97 subjects on which the central government can make laws. The state list contains 66 subjects of local or state importance. The state governments have the authority to make laws on these 66 subjects. However, during national and state emergency, the power to make laws on these subjects is transferred to the parliament. The concurrent list has 47 subjects on which both the parliament and the state legislatures can make laws. Yet, in case of conflict between a law made by the central government and a law made by the state legislature, the law made by the central government will prevail. There are certain changes regarding the authority of making laws. Education was shifted from the state list to the concurrent list by 42nd Amendment Act of 1976. Apart from the powers mentioned in these lists, there is also a list of miscellaneous functions called residuary powers. These are not mentioned in any of the three lists and the right to make laws on these subjects is called residuary powers. The central government has been given rights to legislate on these subjects. It needs to be mentioned here that though there is the presence of a federal structure and a clear division of powers along with an independent judiciary, yet there is a strong bias towards making the central government more powerful than the state governments. The policy of India can turn into a complete unitary character during emergency on the ground of failure of the constitutional machinery and during such a situation the union government becomes all-powerful. Now we will discuss each of these lists one by one in detail. Let us first discuss the union list. It consists of subjects on which the central government of the Indian parliament can make laws. These subjects included in the list are of national importance. These include subjects such as defense, foreign affairs, atomic energy, banking, post and telegraph. The central government has the power to make laws on these subjects at all times and also during emergencies. There are 97 subjects on which the central government can make law. The state list contains 66 subjects of local or state importance. The state governments have the authority to make laws on these subjects. These subjects include police, local governments, trade, commerce and agriculture. However, during national and state emergency, the power to make laws on these subjects is transferred to the parliament. The concurrent list has 47 subjects on which both the parliament and state legislatures can make laws. These subjects include criminal and civil procedure, marriage and divorce, education, economic planning and trade unions. Yet, in case of conflict between a law made by the central government and a law made by state legislatures, the law made by the central government will prevail. There are certain changes regarding the authority of making laws. Education was shifted from the state list to the concurrent list by the 42nd Amendment Act of 1976.
Apart from the powers mentioned in these three lists, there is also a list of miscellaneous functions and the right to make laws on these subjects is called residuary power. This power is with the central government. It needs to be mentioned here that though there is the presence of a federal structure and a clear division of powers along with an independent judiciary, yet there is a strong bias towards making the central government more powerful than the state government. The policy of India can turn into a complete unitary character during emergency on the ground of failure of the constitutional machinery and during such a situation, the union government becomes all-powerful. The parliament may, however, pass legislation for taxation by the union of any trading or business activities of a state, which are not part of the ordinary functions of the government. States may delegate part of their taxation power to the central government, as has happened in the case of agricultural land being included in the purview of the estate duty in many states. Parliament has exclusive power to tax sales or purchases of goods in the course of interstate trade. The federal character of public finance in this country had its origin as far back as the 70s of the last century. Although at that time, the country had a unitary form of government, some division of functions and financial powers between the center and the provinces was found administratively desirable. Ever since then, the arrangements have been revised and improved from time to time. The present distribution of heads of expenditure and sources of revenue as established by the Constitution of India is the culmination of a long period of evolution. The Constitution of India provides for a pattern of division which closely resembles that established by the Government of India Act of 1935. India had chosen a federal structure in 1935 in which a clear distinction was made between the union and the state functions, but the residual powers belonged to the center. Although the states had been assigned certain taxes which were levied and collected by them, they also shared in the revenue of certain union taxes and there were certain other taxes which were levied and collected by the union but the proceeds of which wholly went to the states. In addition, the states received grants in aid of their revenue from the union which further increased the amount of transferences between the two levels of governments. The transference of resources from the central government to the states is an essential feature of the present financial federal system. The Constitution of India makes a clear division of fiscal powers between the union and the state governments. The principle adopted for this classification is that taxes which have an interstate base are levied by the union, while those with a local base are levied by the states. The residuary powers belong to the union. The Constitution contains provisions for the distribution of revenues from certain union taxes among the states. In this context, taxes within union jurisdiction can be divided into four classes. First, taxes which are levied by the union but collected and appropriated by the states. Second, taxes which are levied and collected by the union but the entire proceeds of which are assigned to the states. Third, taxes which are levied and collected by the union but the proceeds are shared with the states. And fourth, taxes which are levied collected and wholly retained by the union. Now we would discuss the taxes that come under the jurisdiction of the union and the states in list 1 and list 2 respectively in the 7th schedule of the constitution. The union taxes as laid down in list 1, 7th schedule of the constitution are as under First, taxes on income other than the agricultural income. Two, the corporation tax. Three, the custom duties. Four, the excise duties except on alcoholic liquors and narcotics not contained in medical or toilet preparations. Five, estate and succession duties other than on agricultural land. Six, taxes on the capital value of assets except agricultural land of individuals and companies. 7. Rates of stamp duties on financial documents. 
paid taxes other than stamp duties on transactions in stock exchanges and future markets. 9. Taxes on sale or purchase of newspapers and on advertisements therein. And 10. Taxes on railway freights and fares. 11. Terminal taxes on goods and passengers carried by railways, sea or air. And 12. Taxes on the sale or purchase of goods in the course of interstate trade. Taxes within the jurisdiction of the states as given in list 2 of the seventh schedule are as follows. First, land revenue. Two, the taxes on the sale and purchase of goods except newspapers. Three, taxes on agricultural income. Four, taxes on land and buildings. Five, succession and estate duties on agricultural land. Six, excise on alcoholic liquors and narcotics. Seven, taxes on the entry of goods into a local area. Eight, taxes on miller rights subject to any limitations imposed by the parliament. Nine, taxes on the consumption and sale of electricity. Ten, taxes on vehicles, animals and boats. Eleven, stamp duties except those on financial documents. 12. Taxes on goods and passengers carried by road or inland waterways. 13. Taxes on luxuries including entertainments, betting and gambling. 14. Tolls. 15. Taxes on profession, trades, callings and employment. 16. Capitation taxes and 17. Taxes on advertisements other than those contained in the newspapers. The union government has exclusive powers to impose taxes which are not specifically mentioned in the state or the concurrent list. The union and the state governments have concurrent powers to fix the principles on which taxes on motor vehicles shall be levied and to impose stamp duties on non-judicial stamps. The property of the union is exempted from state taxation and the property and income of the state are exempted from the union taxation. The parliament may, however, pass legislation for taxation by the union of any trading or business activities of a state which are not part of the ordinary functions of the government. States may delegate part of their taxation powers to the central government as has happened in the case of agricultural land being included in the purview of the estate duty in many states. Parliament has exclusive powers to tax sales or purchases of goods in the course of interstate trade. In any federal system of government, there are certain economic principles which provide guidelines for actual assignment of sources of revenue in accordance with the functions which the respective governments are expected to perform. These principles include principle of comparative advantage and principle of efficiency. Principle of comparative advantage requires assignment of fiscal functions such that there is a minimum administrative and coordination costs, avoiding the scope for free riding and provision of public services according to the diverse needs of the society. So far as the assignment of revenues is concerned, taxes should be easily enforceable and are neutral with regard to location decisions. Principle of efficiency not only requires assignment, but along with efficient provision of public services, it also paves the way for overall allocative efficiency. Specifically, the assignment of taxes and expenditures should not promote free riding among the sub-national governments and should minimize the possibility of market segmentation and impediments to the free movement of the factors and commodities across the country. Thus, the Indian constitution, being federal in character, has indicated the nature and scope of functions of the union and the state government and also the taxes allocated to them. At the same time, framers of the constitution were aware that the allocation of financial resources did not correspond with the assigned functions 
and that the resources gap in the states might widen over the period of time. They provided for the distribution or devolution of resources from the center to the states. It was specifically for this purpose that Article 280 provides for the setting up of a finance commission by the president every five years or even earlier. Let us now move on to the discussion of the distribution and allocation of central revenue. In this, we will first start with the distribution of proceeds from the union taxes. Apart from the taxes levied and collected by the states, the constitution has provided for the revenues from certain taxes on the union list to be allocated partially or wholly to the states. These provisions fall into various categories. There are, in the first place, certain duties which are levied by the union but are collected and appropriated by the state. Secondly, there are certain taxes which are levied and collected by the union but the entire proceeds of which are assigned to the states in proportion determined by the parliament. Thirdly, central taxes on income except corporation tax and certain union excise duties which are levied and collected by the union but are shared by it with the states in a prescribed manner. Finally, the proceeds of additional excise duties which are levied by the union and wholly distributed among the states in a manner so as to guarantee their former incomes from the displaced sales taxes. It may be noted that for the taxes, proceeds of which go fully or partially to the states, the formula of devolution is recommended by the Finance Commission. The Finance Commission in this regard makes recommendations about the percent of proceeds of the taxes levied and collected by the union government and shared with the states and also about the formula for division of the same among different states. Second component is grants in aid. The gaps between the states revenues and their expenditure responsibilities have to be corrected through transference of resources from the center to the states. This is done partly by arrangements for tax sharing, but grants in aid by the union government for specific purposes or general aid have come to occupy a very important place in the union state financial relations in our country. The grants also serve the purpose of correcting interstate disparities in resources. They also help in the exercise of a certain measure of central control and coordination over essential welfare services and development programs in different states. It may be noted that the Finance Commission also makes recommendations about grants in aid provided to the states by the union government. The third component is loans. The states are authorized to raise loans in the market, but they also borrow from the union government, which gives the latter considerable control over the state borrowing and expenditure. The rate of annual borrowing by the states from the union has considerably increased during the recent past. The states also deposit with the union government certain state and local funds which are in effect loans by the centers and used for general purposes. It is observed that the Finance Commission, when asked, also makes recommendations about the issues relating to loans by the center to the states, especially about the debt reliefs for the states. Now we will discuss each of these components 
in the day. For the state, apart from the taxes levied and collected by the states, the constitution has provided for the revenues from certain taxes on the union list to be allocated partly or wholly to the states. These provisions fall into various categories. There are, in the first place, certain duties which are levied by the union but are collected and appropriated by the states. These include stamp duties and excise duties on medical preparations containing alcohol or narcotics. Secondly, there are certain taxes which are levied and collected by the union, but the entire proceeds of which are assigned. It may be noted that for the taxes, proceeds of which go fully or partially to the states, the formula of devolution is recommended by the Finance Commission. The Finance Commission in this regard makes recommendations about the percent of proceeds of the taxes levied and collected by the Union Government and shared with the states and also about the formula for the division of the same among the states. To important welfare and development functions are entrusted to the states. Gaps between their revenues and expenditure have to be corrected through transference of resources from the centre. This is done partly by arrangements for tax sharing. Grants in aid by the Union for specific purposes or general aid have come to occupy an important place in Union state financial relations in India. The grants also serve the purpose of correcting interstate disparities in resources. They also help in the exercise of certain measure of certain control and coordination over essential welfare services and development programs in different states. It may be noted that the Finance Commission also makes recommendations about grants and aid provided to the states. The states are authorized to raise loans in the market, but they also borrow from the union government which gives the latter considerable control over state borrowing and expenditure. The rate of annual borrowing by the states from the Union has considerably increased during recent years. Borrowing is made, among other purposes, for irrigation and river programs, agricultural development, rehabilitation, community development and industrial housing. The states also deposit with the Union government certain state and local funds which are in effect loans by the centre and used for general purposes. It is observed that the Finance Commission, when asked, also makes recommendation about the issues relating to loans by the centre to the states, especially about the debt reliefs for the states. Let us now summarise what we have learnt in this module. Constitution of India provides a clear-cut division of power between the Union and the states. Distribution of power between the central government and the state governments is determined by the way of three lists – union list, state list and concurrent list. Financial relations under the constitution are described in terms of division of sources of the revenue between the union and the states. Constitution of India provides the mechanism for distribution and allocation of central resources. This mechanism is that of Finance Commission. The Finance Commission makes recommendations for distribution of proceed from union taxes, grants in aid and loans from the central government.